Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gary Eigen. Good evening. Welcome to the MIT Campaign for a Better, Better World event in San Diego. First, let me thank our local alumni club for, for supporting tonight's event. This includes the MIT Clubs of Southern California, the MIT Club of San Diego, the MIT Sloan Club of San Diego, Sloan Fly 5 Los Angeles, the MIT Enterprise Forum of San Diego, as well as MIT local affinity groups. The turnout this evening and the energy in this room is evidence of the active engagement of our local MIT community and all of our interest in learning more about the campaign for a better world. Tonight's topic is environment, energy, and sustainability. Living here in Southern California, we're at the forefront of advancement in these areas. We also, we have the natural resources needed for economical impl implementation of sustainable energy. We also have a highly educated population with the expertise and the desire to improve. Our mission as a community is to find solutions that are economically and technologically beneficial for a 21st century world to truly make the world better. During my involvement at MIT, and now as an alum through the MIT Club of San Diego, I've had the opportunity to get to know many of the dedicated volunteers and leaders of our institute. This evening, I'm delighted to introduce one of those dedicated leaders, Eric Grimson, MIT's Chancellor of Academic Advancement, who will show us how MIT is leading the charge for a better world. Well, good evening. Gary, thank you so much for the kind introduction and for your dedication and service to the MIT community. MIT's mission statement, by the way, most of our faculty don't know we have a mission statement, <laughs> but MIT's mission statement, like that of any great research university, directs us to educate students and create knowledge. When MIT faculty pursue this mission, they launch disruptive new industries like the invention of additive 3D printing by Michael Sima and Emmanuel Sachs. They win global recognition, like the wonderful 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics awarded to Ray Weiss for the detection of gravity waves. And they help to shape, support, and educate the kind of astounding students and graduates who grace this stage and fill this audience tonight. It's vital, this work that we do to educate students and advanced knowledge. Yet MIT's mission demands much, much more from all of us. It demands that we use our knowledge to tackle humanity's greatest global challenges. And we embrace these challenges because we know that the people of MIT can deliver and make a better world. In May 2016, we launched the MIT campaign for a better world a campaign focused on core priorities, aimed at bringing the most talented faculty and students to MIT and empowering them to accomplish that mission. Many of you have told us that your generosity to MIT through the campaign has a simple inspiration. You have seen that a gift to MIT is truly a gift to the world. What makes this true is that to the people of MIT, humanity's urgent challenges our invitations to action. From our unwavering commitment to fundamental science, to our zest for innovation and collaboration across disciplines, MIT is turning promising theories into practical solutions. We're focused on ensuring that everyone in the world can benefit from clean energy and clean water, from brilliant design and breathtaking artistic works, from nourishing food and nanotechnology and from improved health care and increased access to education. MIT is firmly focused on the future. And we recognize that our shared future hinges on the responsible and ethical evolution of artificial intelligence and computing technologies to address these and many other global challenges. In this galvanizing moment, MIT aspires to be the true north of computing and AI. And that's why we recently announced the creation of the MIT Stephen A. Schwartzman College of Computing. Through the college, we will integrate computing studies and research throughout all five schools of the Institute. 
We will shape the direction of computing and AI through collaborations, again, across all five schools of the Institute. We will add 50 new faculties and design new majors which combine computational thinking with traditional disciplines. And through these, we will create the next generation of highly trained thinkers and doers who will offer the world both technological proficiency and the cultural, ethical, and historical consciousness to use technology for common good. Our objectives for this new college and our campaign for a better world are admittedly bold. They will take energy, insight, and creativity from faculty and students. They will take the dedication, participation, and support of MIT's alumni and friends. Many of you here tonight have joined in this work already. On behalf, uh, sorry, and on behalf of MIT, I want to thank you. So thank you all for helping. As of today, actually as of about a month ago, the MIT community has come together during this campaign to raise more than $5 billion through more than 100,000 individual gifts. A remarkable number. <clears throat> At the same time, as we prepare to launch the Schwarzman College of Computing, we know that fulfilling its vision will take significant new resources. We've already encountered strong interest in the college, not only from MIT's longtime supporters, but also from new friends who are attracted to its promise. And given this new landscape, we have taken the important step, as I'm sure you saw, of increasing the campaign target by $1 billion to set a new goal of $6 billion. Now, I know the staff are going to win, so I'm going off, I'm going off script just for a second, because I have to tell you a very quick story. I was speaking with an alum in Northern California a couple of weeks ago, and I mentioned the, the new goal of six billion. And he said, you know, six is such a boring number. <laughs> there is an obvious MIT target for this campaign, so I'm gonna take a little vote here. His suggestion is, we go for tau. $6.283 billion, what do you think? We go for tau? <laughs> there you go, Julie, we're gonna have to work a little harder. <clears throat> it's such an MIT number. This new goal, reflects our characteristic optimism, our uncommon instinct for working across disciplines, and our unwavering belief that the talented people of the MIT community can invent a better future for everyone. To make a better world, we need to focus on creating and applying knowledge and on educating future leaders. And tonight, we're gonna to dive into a topic that intersects these areas, how MIT is advancing the science and engineering of solutions to environmental challenges, from climate change to new energy sources to sustainable designs. You'll hear from three MIT scholars who will then participate in a Q&A with you. And in fact, in a second, you're gonna see a little slide up here. We're gonna be collecting your questions via the Poll Everywhere app. So please use your mobile devices, which I know you all possess, to share your questions uh, at the URL on the screens that you see here. Our three speakers will be Megan Aranganathan, a graduate student in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences, friendly known as EAPS. Dennis White, director of MIT's Plasma, Plasma Science and Fusion Center, head of the Institute's Nuclear Science and Engineering Program, and the Hitachi America Professor of Engineering. And Hashim Sarkis, professor of architecture and planning, who serves as the dean of MIT School of Architecture and Planning. And now it's my great pleasure to invite Megan to the stage to kick off this evening's presentations. Megana. The image next to me is of the Greenland ice sheet, one of only two ice sheets in the world. You can stand at the edge of this ice sheet in front of one of its glaciers that stands 100 meters high. My name is Megan Aranganathan. I'm a PhD student in climate science at MIT. And three years ago, I stood in front of one of these glaciers. The scientists that I was with told me that if you stand in front of this glacier and you're really quiet, you can actually hear the ice creaking as it flows. Except I couldn't, because all I could hear was meltwater, the sound of water rushing from the ice sheet through the town of Kangerlussuaq, Greenland, and into the ocean. 
Flooding has gotten significantly worse in the last 10 years for this town of Kangerlussuaq, which has the only international airport in Greenland. So much so that back in 2012, it threatened to shut down the entire country. As we walked away from this glacier, our guide, who's a native of Kangerlussuaq, turned to us and held out his hand. He was holding a mosquito. Now, I didn't think too much of this at first. I'm from Texas, so things are everywhere. Um, but in Greenland, mosquitoes aren't supposed to come out until June, and this was mid-April. Finally, when we got the chance to walk up onto the ice sheet, as seen in the picture, we walked over mounds of sediment that run in a ring around the ice sheet. This sediment marks where the ice sheet used to be back in 1999, and how you can see how far it's receded since. That's the power of being in a place like Greenland, where everything, the landscape, the biology, the society, are all impacted by climate in such a profound way that you just don't see here on a day-to-day -day basis, at least not yet. And that's what, why MIT's approach to earth science is so important, because at MIT, the earth science department is one department under which geologists, meteorologists, climate scientists, and glaciologists can all collaborate and talk to each other about a problem that is fundamentally at the intersection of every aspect of earth and life sciences. And then there's people like me. I study applied mathematics and machine learning. And increasingly, this is a problem that people like me need to help solve. Because it's not just Kangaroo Swack Greenland that's seeing the burden of these changes. Every area in the world is seeing the fallout of climate change. But every area in the world is seeing it in such vastly different ways that it makes it a really difficult problem. And right now, we have a very diminished capacity of understanding exactly how local climates are going to change. And here's why. The way that climate models work now are on a grid. You overlay the entire Earth in a grid. And between each grid box, you can represent the wind moving from one grid box to the other, the radiation going in and out of the grid boxes. But what you can't see and represent is anything that happens within these grid boxes. So that means that the quality of our models is very dependent on the size of these boxes. And because of our computing power right now, these boxes are 100 kilometers cubed, which is huge. And the problem is that so many important phenomena happen at these really small scales within these grid boxes that our models just can't see. For example, clouds. Clouds form and shift at scales smaller than our grid boxes. And that means that we have no way of representing or modeling how clouds and cloud cover will change in 50 years or 100 years. And that's so important because clouds set so much of global climate. Clouds set the radiation that reaches Earth, the radiation that bounces back into space, temperature, humidity, and precipitation, and all of that is so important for local climates, and yet we have really no good way of representing how that will look like in 100 years. That's where MIT and machine learning come in. We're trying to embed neural networks into each grid box that will be able to represent this fine-scale, small-scale phenomena in a computationally efficient manner. And if that works, that could change everything. If we have a way of representing this fine-scale phenomena, we are a huge step closer to understanding exactly how San Diego will change in 100 years, or Kangaroo Swack Greenland and that will enable us to shift and change our solutions. Climate change is a tough problem because it's not really a question about the world ending. The world will always survive. But our societies have been impacted by climate shifts in the past, and our present-day societies have been structured for a climate that we no longer have. The work being done at MIT is intended to advance our predictive power so that we can shape our solutions. If we can understand how local climates will change, we can tailor local individual solutions to places that will also inform our broader global solutions. And that will be huge, because it's really not a question of trying to save the world. It's not even a question of trying to save the ice sheets and the glaciers in Greenland. We're working to save ourselves, to hopefully make a better world. Thank you. That was great. Um, so, 
If you were paying attention, and I know you're paying attention because you all graduated from MIT, so you're used to sitting in lectures. Um, we have a really um, amazing problem in front of us. The challenge of actually transforming the world into using carbon-free energy, and the climate scientists in EAPS actually tell us that it has to happen by 2050, is actually a challenge um, uh, probably only equaled by something like World War II. This took essentially the mobilization of an entire set of society actually to tackle that problem. It's at a global scale. So my name is Dennis White. Uh, I work on uh, solving that in one way, which is called bringing magnetic fusion energy, a new energy source, uh, to Earth. So what is uh, fusion? So fusion is actually the ultimate energy source. It's the energy source of the universe because it's what powers stars. And it's actually not that complicated. You take big balls of hydrogen, you heat them up to about 100 million degrees, um, and at that point the hydrogen turns into helium and produces copious amounts of energy. This can power the world forever and our society forever. Um, okay, that sounds good. Um, uh, and you're looking at me, 100 million degrees, well, how do I know about that this can be done? Because we've done it at MIT already. This is actually our fusion experiment, which is a type of magnetic bottle. Uh, it's about the size of a coat closet. Uh, and where the student's belly button is was at 100 million degrees. We took the student out first. Um, <laughs> yep. Um, uh, and we did that. And the science of this is actually uh, quite well in hand. The challenge is actually delivering an engineered product that can provide fusion energy in a practical way to meet our energy demands. So we're meeting that at MIT with a device that we call Spark. Um, so you'll see it come up here. It's about the size of a two-car garage. It's a, it's a version of the one that you just saw in the picture before. And that can produce carbon-free energy at about 100 million watts of fusion power. And very key, this will also be the first demonstration um, of net energy from fusion, essentially the Kitty Hawk moment of fusion energy, the launch of a new energy source. So exciting. So what are we doing? This is basically around two coupled innovations. One is a new technology of superconductors that allow us to make these magnets so much more effective that we can basically reduce the size by a factor of about 70 compared to the present leading efforts. We also coupled this with a new funding model where we launched a spin-out company from MIT that actually captured private sector investment and is now one of the largest sponsors of private sector research, at, in fact, at MIT, at our lab. So right now, back at home, in the lab at MIT, and yes, they do stay there till these hours, we're working on this new magnet techno technology to deliver this by about 2025. So this is really exciting. But what actually keeps, and I'm very confident this is actually going to work, but this is just the beginning. Because this is the launching point of an entire new industry, an entire new energy source for mankind. And what, we're, what keeps me up at night is actually, it's still not fast enough. That what we, what we need is actually practical energy sources by 2030, which are going towards and actually provide economically viable fusion energy to mankind. So what we really need is about three things, and I'm, I'm actually hopeful about this, because what we need are three things. One, we need the science and we need some technology breaks, and it looks really good right now, and I'm very excited about that. Two, we need the people. It's really easy. We need an entire new generation of fusion scientists and technologists who are actually going to be at the core of developing this new industry, and I want the epicenter of that training to be at MIT. And three, we need MIT. Um, uh, this is a kind of a problem where it just traverses all the disciplines. This is not a particular discipline in engineering or science. We're involving people from Sloan. This takes everything. This is like an all hands on deck kind of problem. And as one of our alumni, who's a m massive supporter of this, he stated the, um, this is the kind of problem why we need MIT in the world. Um, so, I'll wrap up by saying is that this is, um, you know, thank you to the alumni. Th this literally would not have happened actually without alumni. You're going to be an incredibly important resource going forward with this. Um, and I would point out this is a campaign about a better world. Um, yeah, it's a better world for now, but it's also a better world for all the generations to come. And I hope that we're inspired to do that as MIT. Thank you. Good evening, San Diego.
My name is Hashem Sarkis. I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT. And I'm here today to present to you some of the ideas that are coming out of our school in relation to questions of energy, environment, and sustainability. This year, we are celebrating the 150th anniversary of our school. This is the oldest and continuously highest ranked school of architecture in the United States. We also like to think of ourselves as the most youthful. We're youthful and constantly so because we're constantly looking for the future. Bringing in everything that's new about MIT, new materials, new technologies, new intelligences to help better the future of the built and natural environments. As you heard from Megan and from Dennis, that future looks grim. In developing countries, three million people every week move into cities. Seeking fortunes, they find chaos, congestion, and poverty. In more affluent countries, we continue to produce, consume, and then produce waste as if we haven't heard the news. Dancing like it's 1999. In the United States alone, every one of us produces about 2,000 pounds of waste every year, and only one quarter of that gets recycled. Soon we'll be dancing on a very large dump. The new faculty in our school, and most of the research that is coming out of our school right now, are very committed to solving these problems. If I can have the next slide here. At the self-assembly lab, Skylar Tibbetts and his team are using intelligent materials to design furniture, chairs, that assemble themselves and then reassemble themselves by repurposing and reprogramming the materials, saving on packaging, assembly, and waste. He's also working on 4D printing to speed up the printing process and and use intelligent materials as well in printing. At the Civic Data and Design Lab, Sarah Williams and her team are designing and inventing apps that they give to commuters on the informal bus system in Nairobi, the Matatus, in order to guide them and help organize and make more efficient an informal infrastructure system to support the congestion in the city and improve it. And at the Urban Risk Lab, Miho Maziru and her team are working with cities like San Francisco to measure, predict the rising water levels, but also to design with civil engineers new construction systems that can adapt to the rising water level. We're not just doing research, we're also teaching. Last year, the school launched two new degree programs. One is a design major, which brings this ethos of sustainability to the design of products, to the design of information, and to the design of environments. We also started a new program jointly with computer science and now the college, which is called Urban Science, again bringing artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data to bear on the solution of the messiest of urban problems. We also practice what we teach. These new programs, these new research labs, will soon be housed in the old Metropolitan Storage Warehouse right across the street from the main group and in the shadow of the nuclear reactor of Dennis. <laughs> it sends a very strong message to the world that the most vanguard, technologically oriented school of architecture in the world is moving into a historic building and adaptively reusing it and repurposing it for the future. Thank you very much. As moderator of the panel, I would like to invite Megana and Dennis to join me in answering questions in this question-answer session. I understand high technologies are being used to harvest questions and send them to me on a laptop. I will do my best to appear as if I know what I'm doing.
as Chancellor Grimson explained, we'll be using the Poll Everywhere app to collect your questions. So please use your mobile device to share your questions for me, Megana, and Dennis at pollev slash betterworld. So while your questions are coming in, I would like to ask a question of my own. The issues around climate change and finding sustainable energy can seem incredibly daunting. Dennis, you started to talk a bit about what gives you hope. Tell me a little bit more about that, and then, Megana, I'll ask the same question to you. What makes you hopeful? <clears throat> Dilbert. Um, <laughs> so if anybody noticed, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, on Sunday, as we were flying here to California, a Dilbert cartoon on Sunday had Dilbert uh, talking about he was looking forward to fusion in 15 years, which is literally a quote that came out of the MIT press release. Um, I, I can't make this up. Um, and uh, no, so and his his companion says, "Well, I don't believe it because these things have never worked before." And Dilbert points out Thomas Edison tried the light bulb dozens of times, and then it finally worked. Would he have wanted Thomas Edison to have stopped? And the guy sort of says, well, they're polluting. He goes, and, there was, and Deliver goes, aha, there was the inane answer that I was looking for. Um, but to get serious on this, I actually, I think it is actually, um, it's about a philosophy about that a small, determined group of people who have a completely, a new idea about how to deliver something is what changes the world. Uh, that's, you know, it's a sort of an, a an aspect of what Margaret Mead had talked about. Uh, and it's persistence, you know. We've been at this for a while, but we're going to keep persisting until we actually make it. And to me, that's you know, a little bit of stubbornness, but also tenacity, actually, about solving the hard problems because they are hard and because they need to be solved. That's why I'm hopeful. And yeah. Hilbert. <laughs> um, there's a bunch of different reasons why one can be hopeful in the face of climate changes. Um, I think for me, one of the most profound ones is interest at the individual level. The fact that, you know, there's a room full of people right now interested in these sustainability issues. The fact that, you know, on Friday there was a national and international school walkout for high school students yeah. um, and college students about climate issues. And the fact that young people in the next generation are passionate about these issues and trying to make change, even at sort of the grassroots level. And you can kind of see that grassroots activism sort of percolating upwards in a way into our politicians is, I think, very profound and very exciting and provides a lot of hope. Um, and I think the second one is just being in a department like EAPS at MIT. It's pretty hard not to be hopeful because you're surrounded by people who are working so hard and are so passionate about fixing these problems. We have a professor in our department, Susan Solomon, who um, was just one of the pioneers of environmental issues. She was one of the people who tackled the ozone issue back in the 80s and helped bring about the Montreal Protocol to fix the ozone hole. Um, and so about a year ago, she gave a talk called Successes of Environmentalism. And I think you so often hear about our failures and our struggles. You never, we never stop to think about all of the successes that have happened through environmentalism. The ozone hole is a big success in environmental history. And thinking back to those successes and knowing that if we've succeeded before, it, we can succeed again, um, enables you to be pretty hopeful. Is that why you chose to come to MIT? I think there's a lot of different reasons. I think, yeah, the incredible faculty is certainly one of them. And the faculty that's so engaged with not just the scientific community, but the broader community. Um, Susan Solomon is a great example. Carrie Emanuel is one of our other faculty who pioneers and specializes in hurricane research. And he also does so much outreach and so much talking to the broader community. And I think that's so important. And it was so special to find a department where people really feel that and feel the need to talk about this in, outside of the scientific community and make sure that this is a broader issue that people are listening to. Um, and I think just, the, as I mentioned in my little talk, the fact that you know, I can be in a department where I can um, be in the same building with you know, geologists as an atmospheric scientist and go and talk to them about how geological changes and geological shifts have impacted climate. I think it's pretty important to be able to connect to lots of different aspects of the earth science community in this problem. And, um, I found that MIT was a really great example of a place that didn't shut themselves off in a way, but really opened themselves up to the broader community, both scientific and 
sort of globally. And by, by the way, I'd say it's students like this that bring faculty down. <laughs> I know that while we're at it, someone at MIT is trying to solve the problem of Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> but this is not connecting. <laughs> so I tried to uh, reload, and I'm not getting any questions. There's a joke about how many PhDs in the room it takes to get audiovisual to work. Thanks. It's an inverse relationship, yeah. <laughs> but if I can ask a question of my own. Uh, last week, the Design Triennale of Milano opened under the theme and title of Broken Nature. And the curator, Paola Antonelli, who is the curator of design at the Museum of Modern Art, argued that all we can do today is design an ethical and beautiful exit of the human race from the planet. Are we there yet? Absolutely not. I, <laughs> I, I refuse to accept defeatism <laughs> uh, like that. Um, uh, we've, but at the same time, we shouldn't, I, I think it, what I feel is that there, where's the sense of urgency, sort of, sort, of, sort of some of the comments that you made as well too. And this is urgency across the entire spectrum of, of us in, as individuals, and us as groups, is it a place like MIT? We're still a small place, MIT. But I, you know, I, I think we've, we have to come up with aspirational and inspirational goals that actually get us there. And, you know, um, and I would say is that, you know, if you, you know, as an, for my own example of, what, of our project that we're doing, the fact that major energy companies in the world, people like Bill Gates, people who understand the, the power that technology can have in changing the human race, both for good and for bad, we have to apply this to solve this problem. Accepting defeatism is t totally unacceptable to me. <laughs> oh, I absolutely agree. I think um, one of the um, very profound things I've learned since joining MIT and starting to do this work myself is that um, there is often a disconnect between what we see in the science and then what is presented in the media. So I feel like the media goes one or two directions. They go, you know, we're, it's the end of the world. Or they go the direction of this is not a problem. And I think we're definitely somewhere in the middle um, from doing sort of the scientific research myself in the sense of it's certainly um, an urgent problem that needs addressing. Um, but I think it would be certainly a mistake to think that we, need, we can give up now because I think there's a lot at stake that can be that we can fix, and I think we need to um, work with a sense of urgency and a sense of purpose, but not necessarily a sense of defeat. So the questions have landed. <laughs> uh, for Dennis, do you have a commercialization partner lined up for Spark? <laughs> yes, yes. So um, yes, actually. So it was one of the reasons. Um, uh, and great credit to the MIT leadership in understanding the importance of something like this and realizing that if we started to look at this technology and actually produce a spin out a company whose goal is commercialization, because in the end, it's, it's about translation. Uh, we, I mean, as scientists and engineers, we love to work on hard problems, but in the end, the impact we have in the world is translating this into a real product. So we actually, uh, MIT collectively looked forward at this and said, we should be evolving that industry as soon as we can, and that's in fact what we've done. And that's and my partners over at Commonwealth Fusion Systems, who I said are filled with MIT alumni. V very appropriate for MIT uh, yeah, to do, do such a thing. I guess this is a question that comes to both of you, which is, can we quantify the net increase of energy being released into the atmosphere? We can. Absolutely, um, to some margin of uncertainty, of course. Um, but I think a lot of the um, climate models and a lot of the work that's being, I mean, the work that's being done at MIT right now is intending to understand exactly where we are now so that we can tailor our solutions to get a sense of where we could be mm -hmm. um, with solutions. And I think, yeah, so getting a sense of the net input of energy into our atmosphere um, is certainly something that we can do. I think there's um, obviously some amount of uncertainty that comes for just not really knowing the extent of what humanity is doing and consequently for predicting the future, not knowing the sense of what humanity will do in the future. Um, but I think, yeah, absolutely, a lot of our current models are working with pretty reliable data and understanding exactly how much is going to the atmosphere now. Dennis, can magnetic fusion ramp up and down to vary output? 
or do they behave similarly to conventional nuclear reactors? Oh, that's a great question. Actually, yes. So that's one of the um, very exciting opportunities that we're pursuing within within our group. So the 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 energy wick, so to speak, can be turned up and down in a way which is not possible uh, in traditional in tr traditional nuclear. So um, so one of our uh, one of our goals is to actually have a power plant be completely load following. So this means that it can actually vary to meet the demand. So for example, here in California, those of you familiar with the so-called duck curve, which is the enormous peak, then dip in price of electricity, and then as demand goes back up. Um, and this is a really key one, because for us, we think that having not just a new energy source, but one which is extremely synergistic and, 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 and fits actually with other renewable energy sources is actually the key to getting there because it's about having a diversity of approaches that fit in well to, to each other and we're working on uh, we're working on that actually in fact we have some early stage work on that with some with some graduate students who are looking at that yeah I guess this question came from a graduate student it sounds like <laughs> sure yeah uh, Megan uh, could you tell us more about how you're applying machine learning to improve the climate prediction modeling? Absolutely. So this is a work in progress that's um, being tackled by people around the world um, and trying to figure out what the best way is of using machine learning and combining machine learning with climate models. Um, because I think the goal is to figure out a way to create sort of a next generation climate model that combines physics and data. Because obviously, we need data to understand exactly where the faults lie in our physics because we don't know exactly what every aspect of the physics is in the atmosphere and the climate system. But we can't just work with the data either because data is very noisy and we need some understanding of physics and we have very reliable understanding of physics. And so a lot of people are grappling with this problem of how you um, accurately and comp most computationally efficiently combine physics and data to get basically the best of both worlds. Um, and so that's a problem that's currently um, happening now, um, or people are grappling with. I think the way people are looking at right now is using um, algorithms such as, um, for the machine learning people, like random forest algorithms, um, and embedding them within these grid boxes, um, and basically trying to give it data of really, really high resolution models and see if it can predict, um, or giving it data of really low resolution models, like our climate models, and seeing if it can predict very high resolution data from that coarse resolution, da high resolution data from whatever the GC, uh, whatever our models are giving it in very, very coarse resolution. Um, but it's an interesting problem because it's a very, um, it's a very general problem trying to figure out how you can combine physics and data in the best way. Um, and so it's a type of problem that one can imagine um, being applied anywhere, not just for climate models, which makes it very exciting. Um, but there's a lot of different algorithms that people are grappling with to see how you can best combine um, physics and data. Um, and it's all very interesting stuff. Uh, this is a question for Hashim. Hashim, <laughs> as three million people move into cities, how do we, use, how do we house them and keep it affordable? <laughs> Two days ago, I met with Joe Gebbia of Airbnb. And much of the inspiration behind Airbnb started with the idea that we have overbuilt housing in the wrong places and they remain vacant and we need to make them affordable and accessible to those who cannot afford it. In that sense, we are creating a market for housing out of a stock that already exists. I think those mechanisms should be available in, the, in different ways around the world to improve on accessibility to housing, existing housing stock, but perhaps to densify and re reuse the existing housing stock in a more inventive way. I think that's one way to provide housing. Clearly, that cannot absorb 3 million every year, every week. Mexico City, Sao Paulo have started through uh, different governmental plans building public housing. They built housing enough to accommodate the growing population, but they built them in the wrong places. They built them on the outskirts because they thought that's where the land was available. And what, that, what did that produce? Empty housing as well. It's very important to locate housing in areas where it's closer to jobs. And we are failing to do that because we're building a lot of our land, we're building, basing a lot of our uh, placement of housing and industry 
uh, along old land use policy. We should clearly revise our land use policies in order to locate housing closer, more strategically located to, uh, to job locations. We face the same problem in Cambridge, Massachusetts, by the way. Another way that housing problems will be solved is in the way that the provision of housing is changing. Thanks to the exponentially rising cost of housing, we are revisiting the idea of housing produced off-site, assembly, modular housing, uh, more efficient and compact housing systems of construction. And even though right now we're applying them for the most part for scale and for more, uh, affl in more affluent settings, there's very, every reason to believe that this could be applied for more affordable housing as well. But perhaps the most important answer to this question has to do with thinking of housing not as a commodity, but thinking about it as a means by which we build community. And to rethink the very nature of the household itself along lines that are along, along evidence that is coming to us from society today. No matter how diversified the nuclear family and forms of habitation have become, we continue to produce and reproduce housing based on the model of the nuclear family in its very conservative, uh, clear 19th century perhaps sense. Uh, if I think we create housing that truly reflects the future of our society, we will begin to solve many of the problems of housing. There are more questions coming. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it's a question for all of us, which, has to, which asks us what each of us can do as individuals, meaning as MIT alum, to help us, the three of us, reach our goals. Uh, well, I've seen it already. Um, the amount of, <laughs> when you're trying to start an entire new industry, um, that the, the, the collective uh, experience of the MIT alumni, um, it, it's just sort of countless interactions I've had with alumni of wonderful advice, um, guidance, sometimes direct involvement. Um, and I mean, direct involvement, here's a great one actually, somebody who in fact came from, uh, from your school was, um, he saw one of the lectures we were doing, he looked at what we were doing and he realized, you're, you basically have like a, an architecture challenge because it's about efficiently, like sort of your adaptive models about putting, putting it together. So he sends me an email about three pages long, good MIT email, uh, nerd email is fantastic. Um, and, and he says, I, I really want to work on this. Is, that, is this going to be okay? And we looked at his credentials and said, come on board. So he's been a visiting scientist at the Plaza Science Infusion Center as an architect uh, who's basically guiding our, because we're, we're, pretty, we're, we're good on some of the things, but we're not good on design, on efficient design. So it's examples like that, actually, that I, that I feel to keep tapping that pool of expertise um, and, and, quite frankly, passion that is out in the MIT alumni community. Very, very important. The takeaway message, architecture is going to save the world. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, yep. <laughs> He would agree. <laughs> um, I'd like to echo that. I think having um, a network of alumni who are passionate um, and who connect, especially from the student level, having, um, I know so many students from my department who have had alumni reach out to them and become mentors and give advice. And I think from the student level, that's um, and completely invaluable. And I think one of the great assets of the MIT alumni community is there's so many people out there who, um, you know, understand you know what it is like to be a graduate student, MIT graduate student, an MIT alum, um, and to have a lot of really great advice, and are very active and interested in mentoring students. And so, from the student level, um, that's all fantastic. I think from sort of the climate science level, um, I think having people just talk about the issue, disseminate work, is incredibly important. There's um, so many, especially graduate students in our department, who are trying to engage in the sort of science communication. Um, Twitter is becoming an increasingly big thing. I just started using Twitter to talk about my work and it's been um, fun. Um, but I think having the, these kind of um, avenues where people can talk about the work that's being done uh, is pretty unique, especially now that social media is a thing. 
Um, because, you know, before, I think it was a lot harder to reach people outside of, you know, publishing scientific journals, which really only scientists read. Um, so having an avenue where you can reach a much broader audience is really great. And so um, having, you know, people get excited to talk to um, scientists, to talk to the public, and just show a passion for the work, I think, is always really great. I have to answer the question, too. Uh, <clears throat> if I have it my way, I would eliminate the category of alumni. I think the way that education is going today and the way that knowledge is building up, it requires that we constantly learn. And I imagine that as a student who gets admitted to MIT, the passion that you gain by coming to MIT is that you want to learn constantly. And we have to turn that into something more practical. How is it that we can maintain continuity with the alum? I mean, you can graduate but you can never leave. It's almost like Hotel California. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a stage. You go out in the world, you continue learning, and you bring that knowledge back to our students. And as you're coming back, you learn what's new. To maintain that, whether through online education, through the networks that we're establishing, through other mechanisms, I think is now n not just a good thing to do, but a necessary thing to do. We need to learn a lot from you. And I'm feeling that directly with the design accelerator that we started to help our finishing students start new companies and launch them in the world. And they're getting a lot of mentorship from alum. And lo and behold, they themselves are becoming alum that will come back and mentor the finishing students. It's creating a very beautiful community around our school that is a broader network with the alum. And my hope is that that can become much bigger and really formalized because the future of education is that we learn every minute and continue to do that. And we have to find an institutional shape that reflects that. We have three minutes left, so I think I need to come to the closing question. Uh, I have to choose the closing question. <laughs> so many good questions. Maybe in the context of climate change, is the most limiting factor to game-changing progress a political, strategic, cultural, or technological one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm not joking. It's, it is actually that. that. That's actually why I made the World War II an algae, to me, it, is, it, it, it can't be just a technology solution. It can't be just a cultural change. It is literally this, it, it's a reimagining of how we use energy, like I focus on energy, and energy is the backbone of what our style, our, our way of life is, and energy use gives us all of this. Um, and Either we have to come up with a completely different paradigm about how we use energy or come up with new energy sources, but I think it's going to be some broad combination of all of those that just infiltrate almost everything we do in our society. And I'd like to echo the um, very first question about feeling hopeful, because I think this is one of the reasons I feel hopeful is because it's a problem that sort of transcends sort of every domain of the world, and I think that's really fascinating and um, kind of exciting because um, it has such the potential to bring people together from sort of every aspect of like the technology sector, business, economics, sort of everybody has a role to play. And I think that's really um, fascinating and really exciting. Um, recently in our department, we had, um, so for the first time, most of the visiting faculty are obviously climate scientists, atmospheric scientists. Um, recently, we had a political scientist come to give a talk about um, sort of the political aspect of climate change and sustainability um, from the context of, you know, how do we speak about this to the public in such a way that we garner much more political and public support? Um, and it was completely fascinating to hear about the issue that all of us think about, but from a completely different perspective. And I think that is the future, is bringing everybody together to talk about this um, huge sort of global problem. And I think that's um, sort of scary, but it's also really exciting because it really does have the potential to sort of unite everybody. To that question, I believe that there's a deep connectivity among the different components. And uh, just to reflect on that and to act on that, uh, I've invited uh, Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland and now the head of a foundation on climate change and human rights, 
to give a talk May 1st at MIT called Climate Change and Human Rights. So you're all invited. Uh, that's all the time we have. Thank you for very stimulating questions. And those that we did not answer, please come and corner us at the reception so that we can continue the discussion. I invite you to join us at the dessert reception, which is in the Coronado room inside, and our staff will help direct you there. Thank you, Megana. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you all. Thank you.